Recording. Recording. One, two, three. Oh, fucking pulse audio. <laughs> if we can have everyone say recording, you ought to at least wait until everyone's actually said recording before you start yeah, counting. But to be fair, he often never says recording, so I have to guess. Recording. And very and very rarely, once in a moon, A, he says recording, and B, he's actually recording. <laughs> anyway... On this thrilling note, shall we start recording? <laughs> what the hell is the phrase, once in a moon? Didn't I say blue moon? No. I meant to say that. It's been a long day. It's 10.45am. <laughs> Shut up, it's been a long day for me. <laughs> <laughs> Not for you, slack bar. I have a sneaking suspicion Marius is going to put this in the intro of the show before the music. <laughs> <laughs> So it's 2021, and among all the other things that have changed dramatically, whether for the better or the worse, Flash is now officially dead. Hasn't Flash been officially dead forever? We pause here while um, Marius, our sound editor, either edits in a big load of applause or a big load of people booing, or possibly both (laughs) at the same time, I don't know. But... (laughs) Your point is your point is honestly a well taken one. Um it's been it's not been dead for a long time, but it's been coughing up blood and on the edge of dead for a long time. <laughs> There's been notes that it would someday be dead for years and years and years. Yeah. Yeah. It's been it's it's like being waiting for Facebook spaces to become <laughs> relevant. <you know? laughs> one thing that really surprised me, because there has been years worth of notice that this was happening, how many things actually broke? When it happened. Yeah. And not minor things like one major financial institution you could not trade on. Uh, One of the Chinese railways stopped. Like, major things broke. Someone built software for a major financial institution in Flash. Correct. I suspect suspect this is one of those things where someone did a little thing in Flash in sort of, you know, 2004. And then in order to automate it, they went, well, we could re-automate this by employing a new dev team to write new things, but we're not going to do that. So instead, we'll write a script which starts up a copy of Internet Explorer and then presses <laughs> buttons in the Flash thing. <laughs> and then it's and then things accrete around this, like naked yes. accretes around a little thing in, a, in, a, in an oyster to make a pearl, until you find out that you get to 2020. <laughs> Every time anyone pays any money into this bank that transaction filters its way down to someone who's got a little nodding bird on their desk which keeps nodding on the enter button (laughs) to make the flash app (laughs) Uh, this this is how this is what enterprise software is like man all of the time (laughs) (laughs) this is true the other thing to your point of how you intro the segment was it wasn't it has been not even was it continues to be an interesting mix of pure vitriol and genuine nostalgia in a way yeah. that you don't often see. The, <laughs> just the, the breadth of it has been fascinating to read about. It's it, yeah. it, it's weird. I mean, you know, I'm I'm a web guy and an open source guy, and on both of those fronts, I ought to hate Flash. And on both of those fronts, kind of do hate Flash. But equally, yeah, it's a bit sad that it's gone. This is a huge legacy and part of our history and. It's not just, you know, for stupid, nostalgic, it should be in a museum reasons, but also there's a shed load of actually quite good little games and animations and stuff out there, which I would like to see live on and are not going to do so. Yep. Is it sad, though? Is it? I mean, I have figured Homestar Runner stopped making Flash things and and then Dobie was just like, meh, if, if Trogdor's done, we're all done. We're packing it in. I mean, we're talking, we're harking back to an age where the banana phone was a big thing on the internet, you know, and <laughs> Weeble's world and all that shit. And, you know, the, you know, naps are good, Metallica bad, or the other way around. The, you know, it was like, it was just a different era. I think it, it's easy to be snooty about Flash because um, 
it shit. <laughs> but I think it's easy to be nostalgic about those days, right? Because if you remember the days of Flash portals, they didn't require a download, so it was super easy to try new things. There was That's just true. the density of new, cool, different things to check out where it led to like this virtual cycle of people making more and better, really weird shit. And the portals got bigger and more people went, and it was just this awesome cycle where... So yeah. like so much of the game content, especially now, especially casual game content, is stuck behind uh, app stores, which yeah. there's like a very real if there is a big company behind it, they're going to incentivize odd in app purchasing behaviors. And yeah. do I trust this app and do I trust this organization? I have to download it. There's a whole flow. So just trying yeah. out new weird things, that was like the glory days of the web in a lot of ways. And Flash enabled a lot of that. So it's it is easy to be nostalgic about. It is, yeah. I mean, being serious on that point, it occurred to me a good question to be able to answer would be if you are looking for platforms on which games, especially casual games, are delivered, which one's got the most games? Is it um, uh, the iPhone App Store? Is it the Google Play Store? Or is it Flash? Are there more little Flash games than there are Android games? And the answer is, I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> right i definitely i wouldn't answer it with any degree of certainty for sure i i I've, I've been looking for stats and haven't been able to find any which are anything like reliable i've i've seen yeah. stats for the number of flash games differing by two orders of magnitude so i've got no idea how many flash games there are but seriously that's a whole thing which um these games were cross-platform mm-hmm. and Pretty much all free. The idea of charging for a Flash game is laughable. Free with terrible <laughs> Flash, usually ads that were oh, quite yes. annoying and intrusive. Oh, and oh yeah, but but what you're describing there is, you know, iPhone games. So there's no different here. Well, we've traded free games with crappy banner ads for walled gardens with crappy in-app purchases. So it's like, we're not better off. Uh, you know, talking about the nostalgic element, I think it is important for our younger listeners to just illustrate this a little bit because back in the early days of the web like let me share my personal experience i want to hear both of yours as well particularly yours act because you know you have been working in the web as a developer for so long but like jeremy was saying back in the day the web was so static right and if you wanted to do anything vaguely interactive people were creating cgi bin scripts uh essentially to get to, to do something but it was a very flat, static, and from a consumer perspective, a very uninteresting experience. The thing that was a thrill was being connected. Like, do you remember back in the early days of the web, you were like, wow, I just went to the FBI's website. I'm on a server in America. This is incredible. <laughs> like that sense of internet interconnectivity was really exciting back then. But the actual user experience was quite boring. And Flash, I would argue, was <clears throat> the first time it really became more of a consumer thing. It became something that was animated and interesting, exciting. Like my, much as you two- I just shocked a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> much as you two assholes have derided my, my, my degree for many years, <laughs> my degree was in Macromedia Director, which was, you know, the grown-up version of Flash, basically. Wow. And, and, it, was, and it was exciting back then to be writing software- in a way that you could actually create interactive elements, right? Because it you couldn't really do that on the web back then. I mean, it was in the very early stages of doing so. So I agree with you. It's easy to feel nostalgic. It was a bit crap to use. Like I did a bit of Flash, but not much. But it worked. And well, and it became hugely popular, right? Yeah. Like you say, with games. That's the thing. That you can now, as far as I'm aware, there is nothing that you could do with Flash Um in terms of uh, animation or support for different things um, that you now can't do on the web with uh, JavaScript, SVG, uh, CSS. Um, So the need for Flash has gone away. But until that happened, and it took a long time for that to happen, and we're still only just arriving at it in a couple of cases, Flash Flash was around uh, allowing you to do this stuff 20 or so years ago, more than. And that's a big deal. You know, it gave people the ability to do that. So when, um, uh, as you, as you said, Jerry, when Steve Jobs wrote, um, thoughts on Flash in 2010, saying, you know, this will be, um, we should be able to replace this with, um, uh, open technologies. Yeah, that happened. And 
that letter, that open letter that he wrote, pretty much kicked off the process that made it happen. That sounded the death knell for Flash when one of the biggest platforms... For the, for the benefit of our listeners, I should point out, I said that before we were recording. Oh, sorry. Yes, you did. So what, one of my questions, and I'll pose it now, uh, do you think that the iPhone not supporting Flash and Steve Jobs writing that note note that you mentioned did that have anything to do with where flash ended up was it already preordained could was it the tipping point that that was the tipping point in my opinion that was the thing that killed it um when uh, at that point so um jobs wrote thoughts on flash in 2010 as i said and at that point smartphones um were pretty new and weren't yet the world spanning, everyone's got one welded to their hand force that they are now. And Flash had started to make the leap um, into there. There were uh, Android phones ran Flash, a good portion of them did. Um, I would and, contend never well, though. Oh, oh, I agree with you. Yeah, no, the, the experience was not good. Um, but if if... If Flash had made that leap into smartphones, I think we'd still have it today. But Jobs said, we're not doing it. We're just not having this. And you can you could you could do a whole show on the politics and the reasoning behind that decision. I believe some of it was genuinely um it's gonna be hard to provide good experience with good experiences with this technology. But not impossible, right? You can write anything with any technology. It would be possible to make good apps with Flash. And Adobe were already doing things like Adobe Air to allow you to build desktop apps, which were based on Flash runtime and so on and so forth. But because the iPhone just said flat out, we're not going to do this, and no one could gainsay that because there's no way to put that kind of runtime on the phone unless uh, unless the phone manufacturers allow you to do so in their web browser, that was the thing which, to my mind, killed it. They said it's not going to happen. At that point, the device that... Bit less than half the people on Earth were using wasn't going to do Flash. That's the end for Flash, right? Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, it's not inconceivable that was the case, right? Yeah. So I think I think he set out to to kill Flash on his platform, within the knowledge that it would kill it on every platform eventually, and that's exactly what happened. Interesting. So, do you think if Adobe had not acquired Flash for Macromedia, that things would have been different? Because at least from my perception, and, and curious what you both think of this, but it seems to me that Flash was very much, and still is more than, than anything else, but it was content developer first, especially in the early versions. Yes. So like If you look at the very, early, very early versions of Flash, they were clearly aimed at illustrators, not at programmers. And then as Flash matured as a program, they started adding more and more programming elements into it. And you could yeah. programmatically do more with those illustrations. But that created two problems, in, in my opinion. One, the nexus of people who are great illustrators and great developers are infinitesimally small. So you now needed teams of people to do what one person could have done before. But it also increased the surface area of bugs. It increased the surface area of security exploits specifically. And it also made it really bloated and especially on mobile and laptops, super CPU intensive in a way that just destroyed batteries. Like There's many examples of your battery lasting less than half as much with Flash installed, which is untenable for a mobile device. <laughs> yeah. So if they would have made it... if, if I'm going under the assumption here, and maybe I'm wrong, that that was really a, an Adobe decision because Macromedia seemed more focused on content folks. Do you think that would have changed things or no? Or would it never have become as popular in the first place? I Yeah, that that's what I think would happen. I mean, yes, as you say, um, uh, when it was Macromedia Flash, it was much more focused towards um, things like motion graphics and animations. Um, so you could do Homestar Runner with it or Weeble's World or something like that, but you would, uh, and you could have sort of cobbled together a game. I think The Simpsons initially, right? Was, was Macromedia Flash? I, now I've heard that, but I'm not sure it's the truth. Ah, so I've also heard it and cannot attest the veracity <laughs> of such statements. So don't, don't quote us on that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but I think that it, it's like, um, you could, to, in my mind, it's kind of similar to Hypercard, in that uh, for um, for anyone younger than you know us, 
Hypercarb was a thing on the old Macs. This is before Mac OS X entirely. I've never um, heard of that. Man, Never Grandad, had... you're going, you're going back in time now, aren't you? Well, uh, and what Hypercard did was, um, you can imagine it being sort of like, um, what the web does in that it gives you pages and you can click on a thing on a page, it takes you to a different page. Um, it's sort of a hypertext thing and sort of like, um, PowerPoint presentations, but you can make areas of the page sensitive and click on them. So it was designed for, um, Doing something that we'd now consider something like a PowerPoint slideshow or for making little interactive presentations and things like that. But it was possible, if you sat down and thought about it, to do more complicated things with it. So Myst, for example, the game, was written in Hypercard. Um, and Flash was kind of the same in that you could you could contort it to make games out of it if you wanted to. But Jeremy, as you say, as they started adding more programmy things into it, it became a fully-fledged programming environment. Um, and one of the... The interesting things about it, from my point of view, is the authoring experience of that. So, to answer your question first, um, yeah, I think Adobe decided to enlarge it and give it a bigger scope. And maybe that contributed to it dying, but I don't think it would have got as big as it did without Adobe behind it, because Adobe are huge and Macromedia were less huge. It's just uh, there's also just an element of even if there's good reasons for why it ultimately kicked the bucket, like there's just there's just technological evolution, right? Where you just need to make a decision about you know this isn't where we need to be, and something else is coming down the line. Like, wh- uh, what do you think about the you know as JavaScript was becoming more and more of a thing in browsers, right? So like Flash was this kind of like walled off ecosystem where you could create interactive content but then a lot of this kind of stuff was starting to happen more natively in browser without using this flash plugin when did that start when when did the when could browsers here's a question when could browsers start doing the kind of stuff that flash was doing reasonably that that depends dramatically on what it is you think flash does Um, let's say for the sake of argument if you had a flash game something like something like flappy bird right um when could, and I know there's obviously different browsers, but let's talk about the open web for now, not I early IE stuff. When could that Flappy Bird be reasonably made in a browser? Okay, so um, you could cobble things together pretty early on to do that sort of thing. And um, back in the browser wars days, each browser had their own proprietary APIs to do a bunch of stuff like this. So you had all the Netscape layer stuff and IEs, um, a, a, lot, a lot of the IE stuff in there. Um and you could cobble things together in those days. There was um, back in the days when we called it all, when we all called it DHTML. <laughs> ah, <laughs> um, D- it was in fact a DHTML utopia. It if you was, think about it, was. it. <laughs> some some of us even wrote books with it in the title. Um, <laughs> back in, back in those days, you could do this sort of thing. So you could have built Flappy Bird then. But when this sort of stuff really started to kick off, was a bit after that when. They invented things like the Canvas API, which basically gave you a box that you could programmatically draw into. You, mm. didn't, you didn't have to manipulate DOM elements. Um, and that allows you to, at that point, you can do quite a lot of what Flash does from animation, from an animation point of view. The second thing is that, uh, CSS, um, well, CSS really started to kick off around the early 2000s with things like the CSS Zen Garden and the early A-list part stuff and so on. And that gave people the idea that you could do all this stuff. But again, starting to use that kind of thing for animation didn't come on for quite a while because it needed to tie into graphical acceleration and things like that. So around this sort of 2008, 2009 period, you you could do some of it and you could see how the rest of it was going to be possible. And that's the environment which bred the jobs letter. Because I think he looked at it and went, okay, even if you can't do it now, we'd be able to if we put some effort into it, but we're not going to put any effort into it if people keep going, well, let's just use Flash for this. Mm. So what I want to do is I want to incentivize people to do the last 30% of the work required to replace Flash. And I'll do that by saying it's not going to be on the iPhone. So you think the Jobs letter, the intention was to further the open web? I think it was one of the intentions. 
That is a hot take I have not really heard before. Yeah. <laughs> that is uh, a hot take. Like, like I say, we could do a whole show, I think, on the uh, the politics and the motivations behind that letter and behind a bunch of the other stuff that Steve Jobs did. But I think if put, putting cynicism to one side for a second and assuming it's not just all about conquering over Adobe, um, I think he genuinely did want to see the web become a thing you will remember that in the early smartphones there weren't going to be apps you were supposed to deliver everything to the smartphone over the web right when he wrote that letter to be clear the app store was not even a consideration it's not that the app store wasn't out it was their model was a wildly different direction at the time and and that kind of thing is the point that i think he did want the web to become a platform which people could use to deliver stuff onto onto his wow. platform and into, and into other places um you know i mean the guy was a reasonably good guy for at least some of the stuff that he did and that i think is the environment in which this happened so flash allowed you to do a bunch of motion graphic stuff and that became possible with canvas and possibly with moving around actual dom elements with css especially as we started to see um Things like 3D transforms become graphically accelerated. The second thing that Flash did was it allowed access to things like video. Um, and there was, a you may remember, a whole bunch of complexity and standardization misery around making video and audio HTML elements. The point about doing that is that gave you a better environment than Flash because at that point, your video element is an HTML element and can be manipulated in the same way as all other HTML elements. Flash was always confined away into its own little box. You could do things inside Flash, but you couldn't really have Flash interact with the rest of what was going on on your page. You could sort of, but it was really annoying and you couldn't really do it graphically. You could only do it with data. So what it meant was it was difficult to do some of your graphics in Flash and some of them not. Um, people did that for little things, so you will still very, very occasionally see on web page things where there's a headline, and the headline is its own little Flash applet, <laughs> because it because it can do things like render different fonts and so on. So it took some time to get all that stuff standardized. Where obviously Flash didn't have to be standardized; the standard was whatever Flash did, and whatever Flash did was whatever Adobe decided it should do. Which, as a Linux user back then, was just throw constant NS plugin wrapper errors, from what I recall. Oh, so. oh, oh my. God. Ah, well, you see, this is one of the reasons I think that I'm a bit nostalgic and a bit more in favor of Flash than a lot of people are, is that for a long time, as an Ubuntu user, it worked on our platform and all the other alternatives didn't. Much as everyone's like, oh, well, obviously we need to have these different alternatives Flash all to die. You're like, okay, but I can watch DRM'd video on my platform. With Flash... And your ActiveX and, applet is not working Yeah, for and you want to kill it in favour of some kind of terribly good thing which works on Windows and the Mac and doesn't work on my platform, and I'm being tossed overboard here, which is, I think, one of the reasons why I, I've got a bit of a soft spot for Flash because they supported our platform. When they did support Linux a from the very beginning. Didn't. Yeah. Yeah. So backing up just one second there, I, I think you answered Jono's question, but I think his question frames it in a way that a lot of people are framing it, and I, I think it's the incorrect framing. So I'm curious Ooh, if I'm wrong okay. here, and let me preface this by saying that I have less design talent than, than the average seven-month-old. But <laughs> it seems to me that his question was, can you no, now do the things that were possible in Flash? And the answer is probably. But they are Flash enabled a whole different cohort of people to do those things. An illustrator absolutely cannot use HTML5 to do those things, from what I can tell. A developer can. But it's different tooling aimed at different people. That's a good point. My my question was framed within the context of a developer, but you make a good yes. point, Jeremy. Flash wasn't really designed for developers in the early days, at yes. least. So I so. think everyone keeps saying, well, just use HTML5, but the tooling around HTML5 is not the same. Oddly, even the Adobe tooling around HTML5. Uh, well, aha. Uh -huh. Now, I didn't know about this, so I went and did some research a couple of weeks ago. Um, and by research, um, I mean, I asked people on Twitter and got responses. But <laughs> first of all, rigorous, first of rigorous. All, that's research. Shut I, up. <laughs> I look forward to the day that someone's PhD dissertation is just a bunch of printed out tweets. It's going to be excellent. <laughs> Well, that's science. That's <laughs> I don't I don't make the rules. Can um, you imagine a Can you imagine a TikTok dis dissertation? <laughs> I can, and it would be amazing. And someone should do that immediately. <laughs> um, back to your research. 
<laughs> yes. So <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just thinking about doing my uh, my PhD on the Weller Man. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so what I wanted to ask people about was the authoring experience. I mean, I pretty much understand that everything that Flash, I that everything that Flash could do can be done on the web, and I myself could probably do most of it. You know, but the way I do it is by sitting down and writing a bunch of code. And as you say, that's not that's not the authoring experience, which is the other half of Flash. That someone who isn't a hardcore programmer could sit down and build these things. And so I asked for people who do this, for the sort of people who used Flash for this sort of thing in the past, but aren't hardcore programmers, and therefore aren't going to write handcrafted SVGs, which they then animate with green sock or whatever, which is what I'd do if I was doing this. What do you do? Is there the same authoring experience? And I got a bunch of feedback saying, yeah, actually there is, about things that I didn't really know about. So there is Animate, um, Adobe Animate as part of Creative Cloud, which a whole bunch of people suggested. And that does actually seem quite good. I have not used it. Um, but having read a bit about it, it seems like that's the market that it's going for. People who want to create and think about these things graphically. They're motion graphics designers or whatever. They're not programmers. And and that seems to work. The second thing is a lot of people who work on that kind of thing, whether you're doing um, animations or movement or whatever, um, are using After Effects. And there is a thing called... Uh, and After Effects is pretty standard, right? Yeah. Um, I would say... I don't know if it's a majority, but a hell of a lot of people doing motion graphics are doing it with AE. Hell of a lot. Yeah, for sure. Um, and there is a thing called Lottie, which I didn't know about. And what Lottie does, essentially, is it takes an After Effects thing and makes it HTML5. And it's pretty cool. Hmm. You and know? it works? Yeah. That sounds like it would utterly fail. Uh, well, I, I, I have to say, when I heard about this thing... I was sceptical. No, in fact, I'll go far. I wasn't sceptical. I was scepticism itself. (laughs) (laughs) But after a bunch of people recommended it, um, and again, I haven't tried this at least partially because um, Adobe have still, um, for reasons that passed me by, not released After Effects for Ubuntu. But (laughs) I have watched What what could it be? (laughs) I I know. It it is a mystery, especially since even if they had, it's not like I was going to go and buy it for this or anything, right? What would be hilarious is if they released it and it wasn't a snap. I know one individual on this planet who would physically combust if that was the case. (laughs) Oh, man. But I suspect it actually would be a snap if they did it. But... um, (laughs) um, so, I, but I have watched some videos about this, and uh, Lottie and Lottie Effects, um, they do seem to allow you to build things in After Effects and then punch them out as relatively native web things. What they, they're not just creating a box on the web and then drawing into it. This is not like WebAssembly or whatever, where um, or like Flash itself, for example, where yes, you are doing things in a web browser, but Flash is not meaningfully on the web it just gives you a box and then it draws into it in exactly the same way that someone using webgl um and web assembly to port a game is technically delivering something over the web but it's being delivered over the web rather than being the web itself the stuff that um lottie creates seems to actually be pretty kind of native feeling it's generating svgs it's animating them with css uh, it's doing a bunch of other stuff as well but you can think of it as sort of what Macromedia Dreamweaver was. So it's an HTML editor, and it's editing HTML. Well, this was Dreamweaver. Um, And there were some bits of it which you think, oh, that's not very good. But it was kind of, okay, I can see how to fix this, not this completely proprietary product. Similarly, there's SVGator, SVGator. I don't know how you meant to say it. Um, Svgator. Svgator. Which S- does, Silicon Valley Gator. <laughs> which does SVG animation. There's also a thing called Hype. Um, which is Mac only. Um, someone recommended this to me, said um, Hype is apparently very good. And the guy who wrote Hype popped up in my mention said, happy to answer any questions about Hype. And I had to respond, unfortunately, my first question would be, when's there an Ubuntu version? And then there would be no other questions. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but he never got back to me about it. But it seems pretty cool. There's no 
clear, obvious winner, in my opinion. If you want to do interactive motion graphics without writing code to do it, there doesn't seem to be any one very obvious way to do it, but there are a bunch of different approaches. Um, so if you were... Uh, uh, that's what I'm considering to be the thing that Flash did, that non-programmers did with Flash, is interactive motion graphics. Yes. Um, right. And so if you, wa- if you wanted to write interactive motion graphics and deploy them to the web, build, uh, put them into web pages now, there are a bunch of different ways to do that, some from Adobe, some not. Um, so I don't think that those people are have been abandoned. Um, I've, I certainly think that if you'd have asked that question in 2003, the answer would have been flash and there would have been no other answers. <laughs> and that's yeah. no longer the case, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, I have a broader question here because we're uh-huh. talking about, we're talking about, you know, why flash ended and what, what drove it. But when we go back to that, you know, step into our time machine and go back to the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, you had all of these, you had this kind of dog's dinner of different technologies that were trying to push the envelope a little bit on what the web could do. Like we had like Real Player, for example. Um, Silverlight. And, and, and uh, yeah, and ICQ for instant messaging and AIM. And, ICQ um, wasn't pushing the web, it was an instant messenger. Right, but my point is, is that it was people were using the internet in different ways, pushing the internet, not the web. Uh, you know, there was Divex, okay. there was Napster, became a thing. How many of these things survived? Like, how many of these? The, when you think of those brands from back in the day, how many of them? I mean, I'm sure many of them have, if they are still around, their, their name has changed and they became something else. I mean, but how many well, of them? I think actually most of them survived? were routing around the fact that the browser couldn't natively do most of these things. So. Real right. audio, like now the browser just plays audio and streams it well yeah, and yeah. does yeah. all the buffering and other things. I mean, that but that's my thinking. Like, did any of these things really survive? Well, uh, well, from a brand name point of view, MSN still pretty big. <laughs> Which boggles my mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, not the messenger, just the brand name MSN. I mean, they've got a TV channel, it works. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of the actual technology, I don't Whoa. think so, but, but I think that's because. It was twenty years ago, man. The whole point yeah. of the whole point of uh, spending time working on technology is that we can make it better. If we haven't managed to make anything better in twenty years, the only thing I can think of, which was around then and is around now and hasn't changed, is IRC. Hmm. Napster's still around. Get off. It is. Can you can you get new stuff on it, or can you only get like no doubt CDs? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a. I don't think it's a time capsule for ripping off music from the nineties. <laughs> that would be incredible. If like, it was. Like, oh, it's like, just, just Rhapsody all, now. I did not know just, this. It's just old Peter Andre. <laughs> wow. The the only reason why I know this is I use this service called CD Baby when I released the Baron Carter release to push it out to all the different like Spotify and everything else, and I saw Napster on the list. I was like, wow. Naps are still around. Wow. <laughs> no is it, is, and now, presumably, it's legal, is it? It is, in fact, legal. Yeah, um, nine bucks a month. So, for Napster? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is fascinating. Yeah, it's just, there's loads of these. I didn't know this, like I say, until I pushed this music out. There's loads of these online music stores. Yes. Like, you know, we, we've known of, we've talked about Seven Digital primarily because of the integration with Ubuntu One back in the day, but... You know, there's, there's tons of these like little music shops that are online. I was like, how are these companies making a profit out of this? But I don't know. Oh, yeah. No, it seems weird. But, you know, I'm not sure they're going to be making much money from selling my thing for $4. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, man. But yeah, I, I, to, uh, from my point of view, that's um, the thing. The the authoring experience still exists. Um, so you, you can still uh, do what Flash allowed you to do but now have it point at the modern web, which is nice. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I would love to know what our listeners think about this because, you know, it's so interesting. We, we still have a couple of things to discuss based on the stack. So, like, Oh, do we? Do you, yeah. So do you remember we could stop talking the, about the evolution of like <laughs> Shumway, which was uh, Mozilla's attempt to do Flash, but open standards based as the render. And then Swiffy was Google's thing where it would convert existing oh. SWS to... to um, HTML5. I'm surprised that one isn't still a thing because there are. That's the thing is there are still a lot of uh, Swifts out there, 
that have interesting content or compelling things or just cool old well, nostalgic things that you don't want to go away, right? Which which brings us to some other... There are, there are a couple of interesting things there. People have been attempting to make alternative flash round times forever. Yeah. And, and none of and the... Uh, entities like Google and Mozilla, not small yeah. entities. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, so there was um, uh, the GNU project did Ganache, and uh, roughly the same time there was LightSpark. This was 15 years ago. Mozilla made... After that, Mozilla made Shumway. Um, and... None of them succeeded very well because there's a whole bunch of stuff inside Flash. Um, Adobe have always point blank refused to open source it. Um, no one seems very sure why. Um, there seems to be a whole bunch of licensed technology in there which they don't want to open up, and or they probably just or, don't or, give or, a shit as well. Prohibited from opening up. Yeah, like, why they, would they? They also don't give it much just of opens a shit. Up, it just opens up liability for them. Yeah. They have um, no reason to do so. I mean, I, we can see it from the context. It would be nice to do. It would be a nice gesture. I think, that, I think that's the thing, yeah. So there are a couple of interesting approaches going on right now. Um, the problem with making a flash runtime is that it's relatively easy to build something which will do a whole bunch of flash files. So if you want to get the first 40% done, you could put something together in a week. Um, or right. yeah, you get the first ten percent done. You put it together in a week. Then you work on it for six months. You'll have forty percent of them done. No problem at all. And that's what happened with Ganache. What happened with Lightspark? What happened with Shumway? Um, that they'd play. Um, they'd all say, "Look, here it is, playing an actual Swift file, a real one." And right. it they would, would all play it, Homestar uh, Runner, but nothing else. Yeah, and, and and it would do that. Um, but then you just spend the rest of your life dealing with edge cases and going, oh, wow, it does this, blimey. Um, and the only people who could help with that is Adobe with the source code and they won't do so. But so there's another attempt to do it now, which is with uh, Ruffle, which is apparently going to be better because it's written in Rust for reasons I don't understand. But, you know, I have tried it out and it does run. It, it actually works um, quite well. I, I yeah, tried it out as well. I, ha I have downloaded a bunch of randomly chosen uh sort of files and tried them out in ruffle and they worked which is good part of the problem you get with these things is that swift files can load other swift files and so on you think of it as being like here's one file and you feed that one file to ruffle and then it works but actually one would load something or they would load another thing to display the ads or it would load one thing and then chain to the next one and so you've got to have them all and download them all and arrange them in a directory but you don't really know how they were meant to be arranged in a directory and so, so it's very hard um but Ruffle's a possibility. The second thing is this thing called Flashpoint from Blue Maxima. And this is a downloadable desktop app. And then it plays a bunch of Flash games. But the idea behind it is not that you go and find a Flash game you liked and and download it and then feed it to this thing. It's they are collecting and curating all the games that it plays. So you know that every game in it is one it can play. And if you think this game is not in it, then you, the idea is you don't download it. You can do. But what you're really supposed to do is go and talk to them, and then they go and find where it is, uh, get it from the content creator. So it's a walled garden of Flash games? Well, their intention is that it's a, it's not meant to be a generic Flash runtime. It's meant to be a digital preservation project. Oh, this, I didn't see that. Yeah, their, their angle on it, which I think is quite a good angle, is, yeah. okay, these things are going away. They're not going to play on the web anymore. Fine, no problem. But it would be a shame if they all just died. Yes. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, so why don't we? We'll build a desktop app which plays them, and then you know, it, in order to get apps in there, we'll go and t you know, if you, there's one that you want in there that isn't in there, we'll do the work of going to find the person who wrote it and saying, "Can we bundle it in here, please?" Um, and then if there's any necessary sign-offs, we'll do that, no problem at all. Um, and they're working on it, and it's really good in a similar way. Um, Congregate, the big Flash games site, have mm. basically gone. Uh, yeah, we're not really doing this anymore. Lol. I mean, we'll yeah. leave it up and everything. Um, but we're going to mostly shut down the forums and we're not going to do any more development work on this and everything because, you know, writing's been on the wall for a while. <laughs> um, but they're working with, and I forget who it is, I'd have to look it up, but a university, I think, again, for digital preservation. The idea that they want to... Uh, so this uh, university organisation have committed to will find some way to keep all these things running. But whether they do that on the open web or whether it's a downloadable app or whether you have to, you know, the way they keep them running is that you can go to their university museum and play them. And the way they keep it running is they just 
keep a 2008 era PC running forever <laughs> with flash games on it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I, I think it, it's interesting that you've got people thinking about this from a, from a digital preservation, from a museum-ish point of view. So, so last question then, and, and John was already getting tired of Flash. So is I, there a, a yeah. place in today's ecosystem, not for Flash specifically, obviously they're ending it, but for something like this, or is it just HTML5, the answer? And is Electron really just Flash for the desktop? Uh, yes, HTML5 is the answer. And completely yeah. unbiased response. It's, um, it does everything the Flash could do. More, I'm not saying more, you're wrong. Op- more openly with multiple imp- with multiple competing implementations. Yeah, no, I, I agree. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, agree. It's. I mean, I can see if there was actually an alternative, I'd be biased in favour of the open web. But I'm not biased in favour of it. There isn't anything else. <laughs> so is this validation of open source and uh, open standards on the web? That it is truly impossible to not have an open s- standard to see- succeed long term. Uh, it's validation of the fact that if you've got an open standard and it does it, and you've got the support of big, important, rich players in the market, then it works, yes. Yeah, an if, open standard is not enough, right? It's got to have... If if we'd have been... I mean, we were, we were saying you could do all this stuff on the web right from the beginning, but until Steve Jobs stood up, there was never the seesaw tipping moment. Um, so I think if you've got... You, you provide the open standard, it is a necessary but not sufficient component, exactly as John Well, says. it's not just Steve Jobs, I would argue. I mean, the fact that there was the browser wars back in the day, there were the, the just the sheer opposition towards... Microsoft and Internet Explorer. Flash like, was a ma- solution to the browser wars, right? But my my point <laughs> is, my point is, is that I think the this the the jobs piece is one element of it, but also there was a lot of fighting going on back then around you know the importance of the open web, and I think what Mozilla did, especially in making that something that people actually cared about, like you know the, again, like going back to the early days of people. Do you remember when it was cool to use Firefox, where You'd hear about like someone's parents were using Firefox, and that became that became start becoming a thing. Like the message of an open web, I think, was complementary to the fact that that's where the internet was going. Oh right? yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the the point is, it was a question. It was an answer to Jeremy's question of, um, is this a nice case study for how open standards win out in the end, or can at least win out in the end? And my thought is, you need the open standard, but you also need the support from you do jobs or from google or someone like that otherwise your diaspora or or mastodon or whatever you know it works for the people who use it but you don't get to take over the world unless the big players get on your side as well um yeah and then there was a second half to the question and i can't remember what it was is electron just flash for the desktop um i kind of um, um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. As I said, Flash was a solution to the browser wars. When you've got um multiple different platforms competing, and not just competing to have you use their thing, but competing to make it difficult for you to use everybody else's, essentially they're trying to force you to choose a platform and then make sure that the one you choose is theirs. A cross-platform solution like Flash means you only have to develop a thing once and then it works everywhere. And so a lot of people choose that, even though what you get is the lowest common denominator, because there are things you can do on each individual platform that won't be be able to be done in the cross-platform thing. Yeah, um, a lot of people chose Flash for that reason, because you build it once, and then everyone going, oh, but it doesn't work in Netscape, or it doesn't work in IE, didn't matter, because it was Flash, and it worked everywhere, because it was only one platform. Electron is exactly the same thing. You know, talking about Electron, I always hear the same examples when people talk about Electron. Like, you know, Visual Studio Code is built with it. WhatsApp is built with it. Um, I just went to the website. I didn't know that Envision was built with it, for example. But, Loads of stuff is. Yeah. Um, yeah. How how prevalent is it? Very. Because the, the other thing I often hear about Electron is that it's really heavy. Um, uh, well, um, it's, it is. It's, it, it, it's, it's heavier than it should be. Um, but a lot of that depends on using it right and some of that is stuff that people are still evolving still working out how to do it so slack for example is built with electron on the desktop and the slack app was notoriously terrible for eating memory and everyone was getting like, mildly better 
They had that big release that changed it a lot, like a year ago or whatever it was. People were blaming Electron for that, and there's some truth in that. But equally, you're able to point at VS Code or at Discord and say, but these aren't eating all of my memory, and they're Electron too. So this feels less like it's ele- Electron apps are inherently bad, and more like the Slack people are bobbins writing Electron apps. And they did a, re- <laughs> and they did a release uh, one or two years ago, which yeah, fixed a lot of that. A and lot that's of it, yeah. learning how to build apps for this new platform. I mean, right? in the end, when you choose an open source platform with a very diverse group of major, major companies using it, like Slack and Spotify and Microsoft and GitHub, what you're really betting on is that the platform will live on because it will have the funding and, and contributors to do so, and that it will gradually improve, which it seems to be. And honestly, my position on, without wishing to turn this into the What About Electron show, um, my position on this as an Ubuntu user is, yeah, the apps use more memory than they would do if it was a carefully written native app, you're quite right. But equally, if I was to sit here and wait for the carefully written Ubuntu native app for Slack, Discord, Visual Studio Code, Envision, then I would have no apps, all of which would run very efficiently and use no memory because I would have exactly. no apps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, it's... um. So, yeah, I think that's actually quite a good analogy, Jeremy. Yes, Flash is... um. Flash it, Flash was to the web, what Electron now is to the desktop. And on that bombshell. So we're in this uh, somewhat awkward position right now where we're uh, 45 minutes into this segment. We don't really have enough time for news. Um, we do. Oh, we're going to do that? Okay, well, we should outro the show and say, <laughs> glad you enjoyed the Flash segment and the news. Or, that or we're- we just <laughs> drop a couple news items right now and do it reverse order. Let's Let's fuck with the format. Let's do it. I, li- I like that idea. And then let's create an awkwardly recorded intro. <laughs> you people, is nothing sacred? <laughs> or we just I think- record the intro now. See, listeners, right now you're getting a-, a little insight into how this show comes together, which is at the last <laughs> second and poorly. <laughs> um, we do all this planning. And then just bugger about with it live on air. You know what? I actually think that this is in the spirit of Flash. It's randomly lashed together, right? Uh, this is what this episode is all about. Yeah, yeah let's to, do some it, news. It would only be in the spirit of Flash if suddenly I had no memory anymore and then I crashed. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm okay. Glad you, um, yeah, all right. So let's uh, let's pull up the, the news. Um, who wants to start? Should we do the funny ones? Okay, go for it. Uh, go on then. <laughs> Um, okay, so first uh, amusing news item is that scientists have taught spinach to send emails. Twitter's had a whale of a time with this, as far as I can tell, based purely on the fact that people have just read the headline and gone, lol, I'll make a Popeye what, joke. Was that a 2021 fail whale joke, or...? <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, wow. Um, yeah, they... Um, apparently this is actually a thing. Um <laughs> I don't. Th- it's you know, scientists have taught spinach to send emails. This is more scientists managed to plug a wire into a plant in such a way that when the plant does something, they can tell, which I'm sure was possible already. And I don't get how why did this- they how how did they connect that to no pun intended to spinach sending emails? I mean, I'm a big <laughs> fan of fun, playful headlines, but this just sounds. <laughs> A bit of a rage. Yeah. Yes, it is. It complete. It completely is. I mean, they've done quite a neat thing. You know, they've managed to um, uh, breed plants which can Make do spinach things like send emails. <laughs> like, shut up. <laughs> which can detect um, uh, nitrogen compounds, which might be indicative of bomb making. So you can then detect when the plant's done that. Um, at which right. point, it then you know sends an email or whatever. <laughs> But it's obviously the computer that receives the signal from the plant which does this. But nonetheless, you know, fine, whatever. (laughs) Right. So I I added a somewhat amusing one to this, and it's called bluecheckhomes.com. And if you go, it says, get a a verified blue badge on your home. The blue verified badge on your house lets people outside know that you're an authentic public figure. To receive the blue check crust, there must be someone authentic and notably active living in the house. And it goes through this whole thing about how it's a historical, architectural detail reinvented for the modern day to signal influence. 
and it's this very well done site and it's one of those things where you can't tell if it's real or not which is oh, why it's yes, hilarious you can. and at the end they're like no this is a little that bit of a bullshit. joke but eh, not really I will make you one of these if you really want me to but before god I thought Excellent. this was real I read this. And that's why I mean, it's oh my funny. God. I mean, you wrong. guys are so gullible. The first oh. time I landed, I was like, this can't be real. What I mean, the first thought- time you landed on that page, you could not click buy quickly enough and were disappointed when it said <laughs> oh, it was well, not real. I mean, this is this is exactly the thing, right? I I saw it. I mean, I didn't it's not like I thought it was a good idea. I thought it was stupid. But could you but if you'd have said to me, Do you think someone in the Bay Area might actually be doing this? I'm like, Yeah, that yeah. sounds plausible. It specifically names Walnut Creek. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Um, not on the page. And I can't find it. I saw it because one of the things that convinced me, I, I think, you know, I, I um I, I read it post about it or something like that, specifically mentioned Walnut Creek, and I went Okay, yeah, I'll that buy that people in Walnut Creek would pay, would pay $3,000 for this. Not you, I mean, obviously. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that people wouldn't pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I'm saying. And if you think people would pay for it, why wouldn't someone do it? It would be stupid and another indication I that guarantee you just there's at least one house in Atherton that has one of these. <laughs> you know, one thing I've, I've found fascinating actually about this is I, I've noticed this trend on Twitter of this kind of uh, derision poured towards like oh that's what the blue checks think um you know like oh it's just another blue check response to something or whatever i just don't understand why this is a big deal like there's a lot of people who have blue checks like famous people like Patton oswald who are pretty cool people i don't understand i don't get this blue check thing because Twitter have explicitly made it um, a thing which some people can have and other people won't and won't tell you why. So it looks like it's an exclusive thing. Yeah, but the original intention of it, to my knowledge, is that it's to make sure that you... It's not for famous people. It's to make sure that there's a differentiation between an authentic account and a parody yeah, account. Yeah, see, but that's that's bullshit, right? But it's yeah, got to work because I've got a blue check sure and I filled what... in the form because there were two parody accounts. I mean, they were very friendly done, but I was like, I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea. So I filled it in and I had mine within a week yeah. and I'm not famous. But like, you, so... you, you fucking know that a whole bunch of people want one and can't have one but but do they want one but do they want one to show off or do they want one for actually decent reasons like if you don't have if there's no parody accounts of you or there's no like account with your same name then you don't need it but i bet there's a lot of people who want one because it's like it makes me look more famous or professional which it does because it allows you to say only other blue checks are allowed to respond to this I only want to see. Oh, things. you're an arsehole if you do I, that. I only see things. Yeah, but why? But why would it be important to you that someone else's account, which is a parody of someone you've never heard of, is not allowed to see your tweets? That's the whole what- like, the whole like, the whole like. Yeah, there is a. Th- I didn't know this when I applied for mine. What the, the, there's a the thing point. in the app. That, now that they shouldn't add that, it, I don't think they should add it. So you can only see tweets from the blue That's why I think this whole idea of people going, "No, nah, it's to it's to mean that um, I can't be confused with parody accounts," is a bunch of shite. <laughs> what? It's a way of creating an upper class and a lower class on Twitter, and you fucking, oh, fucking know it. Come is. on, come I, on, come on. You asked you asked the question. I just why are I, people resentful about it? And this is why. But is it? My question would be, are people resentful of it? Would they be resentful of it if they could get it? I I'm, wonder I'm whether abs- people are resentful I'm- because they're fucking hacked off that they don't get their oh, blue yeah. check. Oh, yeah, I'm absolutely Which sure is stupid. Like, I've got nothing bunch, against yeah. people being hacked off about something because they think it's a class inequality. And I think that's a very reasonable argument. Like, like I say, I think it's reasonable that in the Twitter app, you shouldn't be able to only see the content from people with a blue check. Yeah. That is class inequality. Completely agree with that. But this narrative is not about that. It's about anyone with a blue check is blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, t- I'm entirely convinced that an awful lot of people complaining about this are doing so because they don't see why these people have got blue checks, but they can't have one. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Okay. So we have John O'Bacon, a member of uh, the Bougie Twitter, arguing with <laughs> Stuart Langridge, a member of the Proletariat Twitter. You, you should be lucky that I'm here talking to you peasants. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I mean... 
I obviously do feel lucky that you are here talking to us peasants. But, <laughs> but you know, there are a bunch of people who do actually act like that. And I think that's why. I don't it, know but, anybody. I've never seen anybody who 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 has used or talked about using Twitter in a way where they only look at the people from other blue checks. And the reason why is because there's a lot of great stuff out there, obviously from people without grit blue checks. And also, I think it's a completely different experience. Like the, a lot of people who have the blue checks are genuinely famous people that are not talking about shit that's relevant to most regular people, right? So I don't know. I just think there's a, a, there's a perception around this. I just don't get it, so. Hmm, interesting. Anyway. Um, um, What's next? Well, well, on a on a sort of related note to this, it's not actually related, but it lives in the same sort of conceptual mental area. You remember um, the September that never ended, um, which was uh, for again for people younger than us. This was September nineteen ninety three. Um, and people who were on the on the net back then complained about the fact that that was the day when it suddenly got uncool because loads of ordinary people discovered the internet. Right. Well, Se- September, specifically AOL well, folks, right? Yeah, well, September was when lots of new people would join the internet because they went to uh, went to university, went to college for the first time. So you always got an influx of new people in September. Um, and so the reason that. Uh, the, the, the people felt that AOL came on online about that time, so people started referring to September 1993 as the so you're, September you're, that never ended. You're remembering Eternal September incorrectly. It was the September where uh, AOL gave Usenet access to everyone on AOL, is why it's called Eternal September. There's just one. It's not every September recurring. I've never heard of any of this, so well, this that, is news to me. Be- bear me. So my thought was, yeah, every September you got new people, but no, but in September, was... AOL added Usenet to their service, and everyone yeah. on Usenet got annoyed. I mean, I was, I don't remember this. I just remember reading about it. Yeah, but but the point was that if that had only happened one time, there'd be no reason to call it an eternal September because there's no concept of what a September was before that. The point was that September was always the time when you got a bunch. No, I of think new it was because pe- that September was so shit that it never ended uh, mentally. <laughs> See, this is the reason why you two don't have blue checks. This is fucking meaningless <laughs> babble, okay? But you're not, you're not wrong. That's anyway, regardless of, <laughs> regardless of whether you believe um, me or Jeremy or the truth, which is somewhere between both of us, about, 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 about the eternal September 1993. This is the most bad voltage discussion I've ever seen. <laughs> right? Some vague but truth in there somewhere. If you assume that the eternal September really didn't end... The 10,000th of September, 1993, was the 16th of January, two weeks ago, <laughs> which feels like some sort of milestone that we've gone over. Oh, my God. Have we really <laughs> stooped to this? I thought it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that is the most esoteric thing I think we've ever covered. It is uh, cool, though. That's a good point that someone's been paying attention to to, to mark that, that I, milestone. I confess, I confess I didn't work this out already. I saw someone else mention right. that. Someone's had a ticker the entire time just counting down. Uh, you know, someone is, someone is like, this is my 10,000th consecutive day of bitching about AOL. So we uh, we might want to uh, pull this particular shit show into the... I was say, do we, we want to end on a serious no- news item or do we want to just roll right to the outro? Um, um, I, I, I feel like um, people have had enough of us for this week. I, um, I, I also, I, I've had enough of us for this one. <laughs> <laughs> See, Google, Google killed the thing, and we don't even get to talk about it. We'll, we'll talk about it in the forum. Well, yeah, oh, we will. So. Well, yeah, but you know, Google killed a thing, so we'll save it for next show. And then we can talk about how Google have killed two things. I was going to say it will be a different <laughs> thing by then. <laughs> <laughs> wow, there's actually. Have you seen this thing called the Google Graveyard? Oh yeah, K- killed by Google. Yeah, and there's, uh, and I went and looked at it and. Uh, it's horrifying. <laughs> I hadn't even heard of half of these things that they killed. And the other half, I'm like, yeah, I missed that. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I like that. Oh, no, that's Wave. Didn't like that. <laughs> I, bet, I bet there's some people in Google who are really emotionally pissed off about that site. Like, it's just, <laughs> they know they shouldn't care, but they just, every so often it pops into the mind. like, for fuck God. God. Well, I mean, um, on the one hand, shouldn't have killed all that stuff then, should you? On the other hand, <laughs> if someone would set up a website called Shit Stuart Language Has Done Wrong in His Life with a little picture of all of the things that I've done wrong, I too would be sad about this thing. <laughs> 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 
I'm like, this you know, true. I don't need this in my life every day staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, you know. There you go. There's a service that someone can create, some SaaS service where you can go and register oh, a page man, I can't believe and illustrate just everybody's failures. I can't, failure. <laughs> can't believe I'll just mention this out loud. Because you know, no, you know, you know now someone's going to do it for all three of us. Yeah. Right. The problem is that Jeremy's just a white page, and Jono, yours and mine, crash the browser. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is very true. Ship of language dot biz. Um, so uh, says it says at the top didn't didn't set up bad voltage on Spotify for ages, and then and then there's a big red line through it because we are now actually on Spotify. We are, so, <laughs> which is a nice way of saying go and listen to us on Spotify, and yes. go and add us to playlists on Spotify because apparently that's how people discover new podcasts and artists and whatever else. So you can see yeah. other people's playlists. Uh, yeah, you can share playlists. So that's apparently Ooh. how musicians get known. I think you can do it for podcasts. Um, so oh, do that and leave some, us a review. Yeah, exactly. Leave us a review. It's very nice. Um, brilliant. So I guess, um, should we do the intro now? <laughs> Let's do it. Let's completely fuck this up. So, uh, hang on. <clears throat> what show number is this? Hang on. We're genuinely doing the intro all in one row and making Marius yeah. cut it up. No, 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 no. We'll just leave it as it is. Marius is going to put this out. This is a completely new. This is an avant-garde approach to podcasting. I it's think. not we avant-garde. Do the it's nuts. The, so we're, we're doing the intro at the end. Yeah. AKA, the, we have a word for that. It's called outro. <laughs> <laughs> that's, not av- that's not avant-garde, though, Jeremy. You, you don't gotta understand. Think, you got to think I, differently, man. So to find out outros. what the show is about, you have to scrub to the last 44 seconds of the show <laughs> and then restart. Okay, yeah, okay. It. this okay. is this is show uh, 22 of season three being recorded on the 2nd of February uh, to go out on the 4th of February 2021. All right. Welcome to Bad Voltage. Hi, I'll see, see you next time. time. I'm so <laughs> <terrible>. <laughs> what the? What? So what are we going to talk about today? <laughs> uh, well, we're actually going to talk about Flash because uh, it's it's being killed again. Uh, and we think it will be quite interesting to get into the discussion. We've got many things to explore in the discussion that we haven't recorded yet. Um, yeah, and then we maybe we may get to some news near the end of the show. Not is sure it the end or is it the beginning? Time, yeah. Hang on, no, the news is at the beginning now, isn't it? Because <laughs> I'm really confused. <laughs> this is like Schrodinger's podcast. Um, uh, okay, yeah. Well, that's the intro. So see you later, everyone. We'll see you next time. And now. Bad voltage. <laughs>